Okay, so we're here at the Global Aerospace Summit and you, at your panel, touched on a subject uh, about an interesting milestone that's coming up uh, next year. Can we start off with that? The 90th birthday of this great airline. Um, and it's a proud moment because two years ago, certainly uh, uh, at the time that uh, the deal making was done between Etihad and the government of Serbia, it didn't look like the airline was going to get to its 88th birthday, but uh, as a result of the investment, uh, we have a 90th birthday to look forward to next year and many, many more thereafter. Let's talk about the aviation business side. Uh, some have criticized the downsizing of the uh, um, route structure for the previous, let's say, winter season. Uh, it's interesting, you know, people who see themselves as, <clears throat> as experts making comments about many things. Um, the one thing that we have always had in our minds from the very beginning is a commercial mandate. Um, flying uh, empty aircraft over the winter just to keep a schedule is crazy. So uh, last winter we had two years uh, of experience behind us, meaning to say that we had two summers and two winters and therefore we um, knew exactly where the pain points were in the, in the network. And so as we've progressed on our journey um, what's been critical has been uh, a focus on profitable operations. So we took out capacity for sure um, and uh, there was some criticism from some that it was too much. We didn't break the connectivity, we certainly did lose some connectivity but we pulled back frequency and so we tried to keep the integrity of where we flew relatively intact. The prime goal was to um, take out capacity to therefore boost our load factors. Now, What's happened? Um, we've had financial results for November and December and I can tell you that basically based on the previous year we've actually had far more profitable operations, load factor increase of four to five percentage points, uh, yield increases of about nine to ten percent and a RASC improvement of almost twenty percent. Um, so by any, by any measure um, I think it was a fairly uh, smart, wise and, and good move. These things were discussed on your uh, board. It ha happened like two weeks ago and for the, uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, corporate government, governance, uh, Air Serbia's board is unique and that's not known to the yeah. wider audience. Look, it is very unique. Um, in terms of the governance, and you talk about that, um, well, I think everybody knows um, how much uh, government governance the airline lacked in its prior years. We have three boards. We have a general assembly, we have a supervisory board and we have an executive board. Then we have um, a board audit subcommittee which we had to go and seek approval from the relative authorities because such a concept doesn't exist in, in corporate Serbia. So this in itself is unique and it's history making. We have um, compliance and ethics um, committees. We have whistleblower programs. Our company is, uh, 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 has got governance like no other company uh, in, in Serbia on top of the fact that we have external auditors of KPMG as well as a government uh, inter state internal audit service. So I think that by any measure um, you know, how we operate um, stands the test of any uh, scrutiny that anyone would want to um, employ over our company. One of the uh, uh, points you uh, revealed at the uh, panel regarding New York flights was that the cabin crew is going to be uh, trained in uh, Abu Dhabi. Yes. Uh, we know that the pilots are going to be trained in uh, Rome. Yes. How is the New York line going? Well, um, we're still two weeks, uh, we're into the third week of sales. I must say that uh, um, it is exceeding expectations um, because um, when I say that, when we set out with the airline, I remember very clearly um, at, on the day when the, uh, when the deal was being signed back in the Hyatt Hotel on the 1st of August. And uh, there was myself, uh, James Hogan and, and the then Deputy Prime Minister and he expressed to James 
uh, desire that one day we may fly to, uh, to America. And James turned to him and said that we'll be flying to America in three years. So here we are. We're there uh, and we're flying well before um, perhaps the three year mark has, uh, has happened. But um, there is never a right time or a wrong time to do these things. The only right time is the one that works for you. Um, we have uh, figured that for our business and our business model that we would reverse engineer it rather than go the traditional route of strengthening a short haul network to then go long haul. We figured uh, that for us at this juncture it was better to go the other way to launch long haul so that that could in fact strengthen our short haul network and provide feed onto our short haul network. Um, the biggest single expense of flying long haul is the cost of fuel and given where fuel is today if you were ever going to launch long haul flying now is the time to do it. So um, first mover advantage will give us enormous benefit and um, we're all very excited and uh, you know the planning continues uh, to a successful launch on June 23. Uh, can we go in like uh, technical details about the planes? Do you want to talk about that? Um, what if one goes tech? Do you want to? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, in relation to one aircraft operation, well, um, there is always a risk whether you've got one or whether you've got a hundred. The question is what's the contingency plan, right? That's always the issue here rather than how many aircraft you have. Uh, we're fortunate because of where we are. We have partnerships today with um, Air France, KLM, um, Alitalia, Air Berlin, Virgin Atlantic, um, so these are all partners and lot Polish. So we have five good options there in the event that our, aircra our, our aircraft goes tech. So we have uh, um, relatively easy access to ferry our passengers across partners to their final destinations um, in New York or beyond. The same thing happens today. You go to uh, Amsterdam, you miss a connection, or your aircraft goes tech, or you miss a slot you have the issue of having to reaccommodate passengers in that situation. So this is no different. Um, so we are, uh, the, the, the bigger issue is what happens if the aircraft goes technical for more than one or, or two days, four or five days. Well we're fortunate because we have a strategic partner who has an aircraft parked in the garage here which is a, a 340-500 and so that uh, is at our disposal uh, for as and when we should need it. Uh, you, uh, you as a company didn't want to uh, brag about that uh, with the media, but you recently donated uh, uh, something uh, that's p perhaps the start of your CSR activities, which is quite new. Well, I think you touch on a good point. You know, companies that do good things, uh, uh, you need to look at what the reason behind it. Was the reason behind it to go and, and, and get airplay in the media, or was it because you really generally wanted to do something good? We haven't made a big deal about this. We felt it was a good initiative. Um, you know, as an airline now, we're in a, as a, as a successful business and, and a national airline, we're now in a position to give more uh, to the economy, uh, back to the people, and perhaps to lesser privileged parts of, of society. And we will be doing more, and this was a first off exercise um, to, to initiate some uh, corporate social responsibility activity. So the Blitz, um, initiative was a good one and a well, well worthy cause and uh, you'll be seeing the airline doing more and more of these in the future. And for the record, you, you didn't want to talk about it, I insisted. So no, it's thanks, true. thanks again Mr. Kondic and uh, thanks for uh, giving me this interview. Thank you.